Magna today. Um, and as a, I'm very happy to have um, Domenico Fiorenza, um, my co-author of the paper, he should um, report today. And as that, that, Domenico Fiorenza from the Roma, so many of us already met him before. He was uh, visiting Prague last year, uh, where exactly he discussed this uh, problem. And uh, today he should uh, give a talk on the formally integrated and complex structure on higher dimensional no space. Yes, please, uh, Domenico. Thanks, Val. Thanks for the presentation and for the invitation. Uh, yes, I'm really happy of presenting you these results today uh, because this started during my visit to Van exactly last year, more or less. So we are very happy that I can present it now to you and that it has just been accepted for publication. So it will appear soon in Journal of Symplectic Geometry. So my, my presentation starts in a very elementary way. So if I'm too slow, just tell me and I'll speed up a bit. So I will start with stating the main results so we know where we are aiming to. So the theorem is the following. Uh, our ingredient is um, finite dimensional, actually, Riemannian manifold, Mg. Uh, and we have an additional ingredient. ingredient. Uh, it, it is this chi, and chi is an airfold vector cross product. I will define what it is, which I require to be parallel with respect to the Riemannian metric. And then we take a um, closed oriented uh, manifold S, which we require to have a specific dimension. So S will be required to have dimension R minus one, where R is precisely the degree of the airfold vector product. And then the following happens. Uh, we consider the, the oriented space shape. So we take the immersions of S into M and quotient this by oriented diffeomorphic of S. And here, to be more precise, we have to say that these are just free immersions, that is immersions on which the homomorphism group act without fixed points. This allows me to take a good quotient of this. So to be more precise, I, I will denote this by B plus F, Fm. And the result is that this space, which is an infinite dimensional manifold, has a structure of formally Keller manifolds. So what do we intend by saying that this is a formally Keller manifold? So it is like being a Keller manifold. So it will have a Riemannian metric, which will just be the L2 metric. It will have um, a complex structure. So there will be an endomorphism J of the tangent space. And J will be formally integrable. So formally is referred to the fact that J will have vanishing an Inhoist tensor. In finite dimension, this is perfectly equivalent by Newlander Niremer to the fact that the manifold admits a complex atlas. Uh, while in infinite dimension, this is not anymore true. So there's this distinct, distinct distinction between being formally integrable, this is just the vanishing of the Ninoist tensor, and being a complex, an infinite dimensional complex manifold. That means having uh, holomorphic coordinates. Okay, so where do we start from? We start from the very beginning. I have to explain several terms in the statements of the theorem. And the first of it is the notion of vector cross product on a Riemannian manifold. So let me start with the basic example of a vector cross product, the standard vector cross product in R3. So we pick the standard orthonormal basis E1, E2, E3, and the vector cross product is just defined by E1 cross E2 is E3, E2 cross E3 is E1, and E3 cross E1 is E2, 
and with then the rule that this is anti-symmetric, at least on the base. So EI cross EJ is minus EJ cross EI. And in order to give a more general definition of what an air fold cross product can be, we have first to understand what are the abstract properties, I mean, independ independent of the base properties of the vector cross product in R3. So let me call R3 V, just to make it less concrete and more abstract. So the property that the product is uh, anti-symmetric means that it is a linear map from V wedge V to V. And the way it is defined uh, as this peculiar property, if I take the cross product of two vectors, V and W, this is orthogonal both to V and to W. And when I say orthogonal, I'm using the inner product, so the Euclidean structure, and then on a manifold, this will be the Riemannian structure. So the notion of vector cross product, when I generalize it this way from the orthonormal basis, that in any case would require a metric to be defined as orthonormal, of course, to a more abstract setting, explicitly, explicitly use the notion of the metric. And the second property of the vector cross product on R3 is that it is actually an isometry between V wedge V, where V is R3 and V. So the norm of the cross product of V and W is the same as the norm of the wedge product of V and W, where the metric on the wedge product is the one induced by the metric on V. And there's also a third property. This is not part of the definition, but it is a consequence, uh, which is the following. We can take three vectors and use the inner product to define a three linear form. So we take the cross product of V with W and pair it with Z. And what happens is that the properties of the cross product force this, this trilinear form to be anti-symmetric. And this is a very special anti-symmetric tree form on a three-dimensional vector space with a metric. It is just the volume form. OK, so now that we have investigated a bit what happens for R3, we are ready to define what is an air fold vector cross product. This definition dates back, dates back to the 60s and is due to gray and is the following. So we start with a real vector space endowed with an Euclidean inner product. And then an airfold vector product is some linear map chi from the airfold wedge product of V with itself to V. So the case of the standard cross product is a twofold cross product. And the properties are those that generalize the properties of the cross product on R3. So if I take R vectors and I apply chi, I will get a vector. And this vector has to be orthogonal to all the vectors I've computed chi on. And then the norm of chi of v1, vr has to be equal to the norm of v1 wedge wedge vr. So it has to be an isometry. And, and again, I can use the Euclidean product to associate with an airfold cross product, an r plus one form. When I write form here, I mean just an anti-symmetric linear form which I will denote by phi chi, uh, which is just the cross product of the first R vectors against paired with the R plus one. And okay, now that we have a definition, we can try to build up examples. And one example is the 
twofold cross product on R3, the standard one. And the question is, are there other examples? And the answer is yes, and it is a non-trivial answer. It's a, an interesting answer. So let us first, so this is due to brown and gray, the complete classification, but oh, I, I'm anticipating that there will be four families. But let me just show you what the first family is. Because the first family is something we can think of quite easily. So the first family is the case when R is one. So R equal one means that chi is just an endomorphism of V. And this endomorphism has the property that chi of V is always orthogonal to V and it is also an isometry. And an example of this should immediately come to your mind. Uh, the, say the multiplication by the imaginary unit, let us call it J as it is, it is usual over complex number seen as R2 as this property. And indeed, the first family shows that when R is one, this is essentially the only possibility. So when R is one, uh, a one fold cross product is precisely um, a complex structure. So in this case, the dimension of the real vector space has to be even, and it is the complexification of a real vector space of half its dimension. And what will be the associated two form in this case? Well, it will simply be the Keller form of the metric. If you just look at this definition, phi of j will be j of v against w, which is by definition the Keller form of a complex structure. Okay, so this is the first family and it, the twofold cross product on R3 is of course not an example of this. Uh, both because R is two in that case and not one, and because the dimension of R3 is three and that is clearly not even. So there is at least a second family, and the second family is the one containing the standard cross product on R3. So now the dimension is any dimension, so we just take any finite dimensional Euclidean vector space. But now the constraint is on the foldness of the cross product. So R has to be M minus one. And in this case, phi chi will be a top form, a top antisymmetric form, and it will be, of course, the volume form. And then there are still other two examples since I'm anticipating that the examples are four. The third one asks R equal two and M equal seven. And in this case, phi chi is a tree form and it is the associative tree form on R7. So it's, it is that particular tree form on R7 whose stabilizer is the exceptionally grouped GQ. And the last example is when R is three and M is eight in this case. And now phi chi is a particular four form on R8. It is the so-called Cayley form. And this is that special four form whose stabilizer is spin seven. So spin seven is not exceptional, but here what is exceptional is the embedding of spin seven into S or eight. So the Kelly form is precisely that four form on R I on R eight that realizes spin seven as a stabilizer for an S O eight action. Dominico, let me make some comment. Yes, of course, please. Yes. So that's a, um, uh, uh, you say that's a, uh, I, I check on so, um, recently found that's, that's a, um, there's a very good guy, uh, Leong, uh, Nai Chang Leong from Hong Kong. 
he only wrote the seven and year ago that he can relate it to uh, Kele form to uh, mm -hmm. how to say Octonian algebra by mm -hmm. introducing the notion of the how to say twisted automorphism yeah and then you twist it by some uh, uh, very natural uh, usually twist it that mean by some linear uh, tensoring something right and then he says that the exactly CP7 is a group of on twisted isomorphism of the octonian and his mm. paper is in uh, GDG um, geometry of the, uh, uh, over norm algebra so if uh, somebody likes and I can send you later reference but of, of course you can check his paper in the math review and the files immediately okay thanks ah, thank you okay uh, so we have four families yeah, uh, may I ask a, an elementary question? Sure. Uh, so this uh, requirement of uh, on chi of being an isometry, uh, yes. does it not imply that chi has to be injective as a linear map? Uh, yes, of course. So in the, the, the third and fourth families, this is uh, satisfied? Uh, yes, it is. And, and th that's a strong requirement. And yeah. that, that is what makes it hard to have examples. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it is just injective, it's not uh, a, bi a bijection. Right, okay. So the, the dimension... The, the target has a larger dimension of... Right, so, so, the, so the dimension of V has to be larger than the dimension of the wedge, the wedge product of so several... I'd say yes. Ones. So... Uh, Domenico, my my screen has disappeared, so I have Yeah, to your, your screen is not being shared. Green. Yeah. Okay. You have to yes, share I, if I do not touch it for long enough, ah, it disappears. I see. So. I see. Uh, let, let me reshare in a, in a second. Yeah. Okay, here's the thing. So let's see. So when M is seven, then R is two. Uh, we are going. I mean, uh, the the domain so of the map would be two forms on seven-dimensional space, but I think yes, it's... that's seven over two, and we are going to. So indeed, there's something. It's but the dimension of forms are always kind of go up until you get to the middle. So yes, that, that's true. So there's some. I think there's something. Maybe I've written that incorrectly. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that it should be the, the correct thing. Uh, I'll come back to this point. Okay, later. yeah. So I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. No, I, it, it's probably something wrong, wrong on my side, but. Okay, okay. I, I, I fix that hopefully by the end of this talk. So, <clears throat> so we have this. Um, so, that th these are the four families, th this I'm pretty sure of. Uh, so, it, it, it is something in the second condition that I already brought wrong. So, <clears throat> so, we have these two infinite families and two exception families. And, and now we move this. Vector space definition to uh, a Riemannian manifold definition. So, if we start with a Riemannian manifold MG, then a vector cross, cross product is just the datum of a vector cross product on any tangent space. And here, an interesting requirement is asking that the vector cross product is compatible with the metric. And the requirement we do is that it is parallel, so that it's covariant derivative, of course, with respect to the Levi Civita connection is zero. And then if we make this assumption, or better if we ask this, the four families we had on tangent spaces become these four families of Riemannian manifold. So first case is Keller manifolds, second family become is any Riemannian manifold, and in this case the, the forms are respectively the Keller two form and the volume form. And the other two cases are um, 
So why I've written three and four here? This should be seven and eight, of course. So M is a torsion-free seven-dimensional G2 manifold in the third family, and M is a torsion-free spin seven-eight manifold in the fourth case. Okay, so far to set what is the first ingredient in the theorem. So we have one manifold in one of these four, family, four families. And then the second ingredient is uh, an old, well, not so old, it should be from the 80s, result by Brilinski on the loop space of Riemannian three manifolds. And Brilinski's theorem precisely says that if we consider a Riemannian three manifold and we consider loops into it, so these are immersed, freely immersed loops, uh, then this quotient, this uh, space of loops, as a structure of infinite dimensional Keller manifold. And Formal we want to compare yes. these, yes? That is the only Forman, you just forget the Forman Keller. Oh yes, this is, uh, when I, I say something about infinite dimensional spaces, uh, I always mean Forman. So I, I mean that there is a complex structure whose mean noise tensor vanishes. This is, will always be the assumption. So, a Riemannian three manifold, as the one in the statement of Prilinsky's theorem, is actually one example in the second family of the Brown Grady gray classification. This corresponds having R equal two and M equal three. And S1, the, the manifold that I'm mapping, to M as dimension one. So it is a compact oriented manifold whose dimension equals or M minus two, if I write that as R minus, uh, as three minus two, or two minus one. So if I think of one as three minus two, then I'm thinking of S1 as a co-dimension two manifold into M. And focusing on this point of view, uh, Lebrun was able to extend Brinitsky's result to any co-dimension two manifold in an M-dimensional Riemannian manifold. So Lebrun's extensions can be stated like this. We start with an M-dimensional Riemannian manifold, take S, compact, oriented, and M minus two dimensional manifold. Um, then what we have is that the, the shape space, the free immersions modulo oriented diffeomorphisms as a structure of a Keller manifold. So this properly generalized Brilinski's result to an arbitrary dimension. And the focus here is on the co-dimension two aspect. But again, we can rewrite this totally in terms of R, of the arity of the vector cross product that exists on any Riemannian manifold. So if you want to do this, Lebrun's theorem becomes the following statement. So we take a Riemannian manifold. We <coughs> take chi a parallel airfold vector product of type two. So in saying this of type two, I'm hiding the fact that this means that R precisely is precisely equal to dimension of M minus one, but I'm saying this in a way that this is not manifest. What is manifest is just an airfold vector product and the fact that it is one of the four families. So this is of type two in this case. So we take an airfold 
vector product of type 2 in the Brown gradient classification. And we take S, which is R minus 1 dimensional, compact oriented, and then the space of immersion modulo diffeomorphism as the structure of always formal Keller manifold. And in this form, Lebrun's statement is precisely an instance of the main statement I want to present today. And so, so yes? Can you say uh, again, uh, maybe I, I missed it. Uh, so the Keller uh, structure is defined, or oh, sorry, the, the complex structure, the formal complex structure, Yes. Uh, how is it defined on this shape space? Oh, we'll come to it. Okay. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not I, something I will define simple. it. So the so I, I have to tell you how the uh, the endomorphism of the tangent uh, space is defined, and I, I will come to to this later. It, it will okay, be thanks. completely explicit. So in this is in the first in this first part. I I just wanted to translate Lebrun's theorem into a special case of the statement that I gave at the beginning. So the natural question is what happens in the other three families? So let us begin with the first family. The first family is R equal one, and so R minus one is zero. This means that S is a point. Well, more generally, it is a disjoint union of points, but maps from a disjoint union on, of points to M is just M times M N times. So we can reduce the statement to the connected case. So if we take S to be a point, the space of immersion of S into M modulo diffeomorphism of S is just M. Uh, in the general case, it will be the symmetric product. The symmetric product would be uh, actually singular. And here you see where the freeness of the immersion comes in. Removing the immersion with non-trivial stabilizer precisely gives me a good quotient. And okay, so it will be M or the, the smooth part of the symmetric power of M if take S not to be connected. And okay, now what is the statement? The statement is that if M is a Keller manifold, then M has a Keller structure, which is a, a pretty trivial statement. So for family one, the, the statement is completely obvious. And then we have the other two families. So we have family three, and uh, family three is torsion free G2 manifold. And in this case, um, R is two. And so uh, I'm again considering loop spaces. So we're talking about loop spaces in torsion free G2 manifolds. And these two have a um, Keller structure. And this is due to Verbitsky. And the Verbitsky proof is really an ad hoc technique. It uses the fact that we are working with a torsion free G2 manifold. So, with three out of four solved, it is very tempting of conjecturing that this should be true also for the fourth family. And unfortunately, the, the technique that uses Verbitsky for G2 does not generalize at least not obviously, uh, from the third family to the fourth family. So at least up to my knowledge, the, the fourth case uh, remained open. And in 2009, so quite recently, uh, there's a PhD thesis by Heinrich, which gives a new proof of the original result by Brilinski. And the, the new proof consisted in this. In order to prove that we have a Keller structure, uh, it is exhibited an explicit form for the Levi-Civita Levi connection on the shape space. 
And through this explicit description of the Levi-Civita connection, Heirich can show that the complex structure is parallel. And the idea is to write the Levi-Civita connection as some very explicit connection that I will call the Heirich connection plus another term. And as the Heirich connection, which I denote here by nabla perp, is already torsion free, then B will be symmetric. And this will guarantee that this nabla LC uh, will be torsion free as well. And then all the ability is in choosing such a B in order that this sum nabla pair plus B is compatible with the metric. So by uniqueness, this will be the levy connection. Um, I must say that this idea is not completely new. It was already anticipated by Mitchell and Mumford on um, their work on shape spaces. But I, I, I will continue calling this the high risk connection since. Um, Just briefly, my comment yeah. was uh, Mitchell sure. and Mumford, they described that, that uh, not so explicit like yeah. um, Henry, and uh, actually they write the equation for geodesy. And once you know that this equation, you need to see the nap, nap, uh, NLC and but the equation very long. Somehow you can extract the Nabla NLC, La Lichi Chivita, but uh, not in the form of the Henry. And uh, uh, the uh, analytics, and you see that uh, on this uh, low count coordinate, IG, Q, and uh, upper uh, lower index, that, that is not. Uh, not so, at least not so geometric like in Hendrik and the, uh, later in our paper. Yes, I, in, 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 what we need to work is an explicit expression actually. That, that, that is essential to, to, to what we do. So, so what we do when I say we, I, I mean we fun. So uh, we give a a new proof inspired by Eric's work, but actually a new proof of the torsion freeness. And this new proof uh, requires some lemma. Uh, this lemma is quite technical. So in this presentation, I call it the technical lemma and I will not explicitly write it. Uh, but what is uh, basically the, the technical lemma? The technical lemma says the following. Uh, we pick Q vectors two tangent vectors at a point in the shape space. And these two vectors, call them U and V, can be extended to vector fields along a surface into the shape space. And in such a way that these two vectors fields are parallel with respect to each, each other we, uh, with respect to this connection nabla perf. So, uh, you can extend tan pairs of tangent vectors to pairs of vector fields, not on the wall shape space, but on a surface on it, uh, in such a way that they are parallel. And this is enough. So something that may be familiar to you is that, for instance, to define parallel transport along a line, you do not need the, a vector field defined over the wall manifold, you just the vector field to be defined over the line you are going to use for the parallel transport. And the same phenomenon applies to checking the torsion of a connection. You just need your vector fields to be defined on a surface into your manifold. And here the trick is the ability of extending pairs of vectors to pair of mutually or parallel vector fields. And this is the technical point in the proof. Okay, so what we do then? Well, then the fact is that this technical lemma nicely combines with uh, the construction of the almost scalar structure on uh, the shape space, which is due to Lee and Leung. And this I will recall later so that I, I can say what is the, the almost scalar structure that we prove to be integrable, at least formally. And in this way, what we get is a complete uniform proof 
for all the four families. And in particular, this gives uh, a proof for the missing four family. Okay, so in this second part of the talk, which is a slightly more technical, I explain what is the Lee Leon construction and how we get to the to the proof. So Lee Leon construction starts with the evaluation map from the space of immersions to times S to M, which is just uh, the map that takes an immersion, say phi, a point of S, let's call the point X, and evaluates phi on X. And here I do not require the immersions to be free since I'm not quotienting any diffeomorphic group. And one uses the evaluation map to define a transgression from differential forms over M to differential forms over the space of immersions. Uh, how do we do this? Well, we start from a differential form over M, we pull it back through the evaluation to the product immersions, space of immersions times S, and then we integrate over S, and we end up into forms over the space of immersions. And notice that in this step, we are using the fact that S is compact and oriented, where we integrate over S. This was apparently not needed in any of the statements above this point. And in the last case, uh, two dimensional. Sorry? In the fourth case, this S is a surface, right? Uh, so in the fourth case, S is a surface, yes. Yes, and so you, you assume that this uh, surface is oriented? Yes, uh, the S is always compact and oriented. Yes, yes, okay. By, by assumption. So I, I, I was pointing out that in all the statements I, I, I gave above this point, one may have wondered, but where does the compactness and orientedness of S come into play? Is and it, it comes into play in describing this uh, transgression map. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome for the comment. And okay, now we can make the oriented diffeomorphism group act on this. The construction is invariant. I need now diffeomorphism to be orientation preserving in order to maintain compatibility with orientation of S. And, and now we can quotient by diffeomorphism. And in order to have a good quotient, I will restrict attention to free immersions and we get a transgression map. So K forms over M goes to K minus dimension of S forms over the shape space. And since this is made up of two parts, one is a pullback, which is even a morphism of differential graded commutative algebras and a fiber integration which is always a morphism of chain complexes. This is a morphism of chain complexes. So in particular, closed forms of on M transgress to closed form on the shape space. And this will be used. Okay, so let us now take chi to be an airfold vector cross product on M. So this means that the associated form is an R plus one form on M. So if the dimension of S is R minus one, as I am assuming, the transgressed form will have degree R plus one, which is the starting degree, minus R minus one, so two. So this will be a two form. And this will be the two form associated with a one-fold cross product. And a one-fold cross product, we said is an example of the, of the first family. And so it is a complex structure. So it's some linear operator from the tangent space to the tangent space, such that J squared is minus one. And this is how the J is defined on the space space. I hope this answers 
Igor's questions. Igor? Um, so this is a, a two form now. Yes, Omega and this two form, form is yeah. the two form. So I have also a metric. So this two form is the two form of uh, associated with some J. Okay. And this J is my J. So at this point, I know that J squared is minus one. Okay. Okay. But so I do not the, know. The, the, the R, R plus one form that was on the original space is transformed into two form by, by transgression. That's the point. Yes, because okay. dimension of S is R minus one. So R plus one minus R minus one is two. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. And this, the trick, and, and this shows you that what really counts in the construction is the interplay between the dimension of S and the foldness of the product. Mm -hmm. Not the dimension of the ambient. Yes, but this J is always an almost complex structure independent of omega. Yes, of course. You, when you fix a airfoil pro vector cross product, then immediately you have a, this almost complex structure. Yes, absolutely. What, what I was pointing out is that uh, what counts is not the co-dimension of S with respect to M, but the co-dimension of S with respect to chi, in a sense. Yes to the degree of the vector cross product, not of the ambient dimension of M. Okay, very good, thanks. So for instance, when dimension of S is one, I want to have a twofold cross product. And so this can either happen for a three dimensional Riemannian manifold, but exceptionally also for a seven dimensional G2 manifold. Okay, so all this provides me with my j, so j squared is minus one, and we have to find a way to prove that this j is uh, parallel. So <clears throat> notice that as transgression is a morphism of chain complexes, if the form of the vector cross product is closed, then its transgressed form is closed. And so in particular, in this case, the uh, shape space will have an almost scalar manifold structure. So a scalar will refer to the fact that the two form is closed, while without this assumption is just almost Hermitian. And almost refers to the fact that at, to this point, J is not necessarily integrable even formally. So as close form goes to close form, it is naturally conjectured that parallel forms goes to parallel form. And so that parallel cross products go to parallel cross products and so to parallel complex structure in this case. And in this case, we would have the, the shape space would be actually a formal, formally scalar manifold. And let me briefly comment on this. So if the cross product is parallel, then the corresponding form is parallel. And so in particular, the associated form is closed. And so it transgresses to a closed form. So we are in the almost scalar situation. And in an almost scalar situation, uh, it is perfectly equivalent to prove that the complex structure is parallel or that it's Ninois tensor vanishes. So we are actually proving these two things together. And okay, so this is the statement. The main statement can be reduced to saying this conjecture is true. So, so can you something. Sorry? Can, can, can you say again the difference between formal Keller and Keller? Yes. So, um, uh, no, it, it, between almost Keller and Keller. So, we, we have. Yeah, almost Keller and Keller, I know, but I don't Okay. So, uh, formally Keller, formal the, Keller, you, formal you Keller means two, that two, the, the two complex structure. Always. Sorry? In my eyes, you prove always that it's Keller. 
Oh, no, no. Uh, I mean, formally Keller... Maybe I don't understand what you say by formal Keller. So, yeah, let's try again to explain. Yes. So, formally Keller means that the complex structure has vanishing knee noise sensor. Okay. This is also in the Riemannian case. When you have a symplectic form, and you have also a parallel structure with respect to the elevation determination, then it is implied that the manifold is Keller. Yes, because in finite dimension, having vanishing noise sensor is equivalent to have uh, a complex structure. Still, I don't understand what is the difference. Uh, so Domenico, do you mean by complex yes. structure? Like structure uh, having charts. holomorphic coordinates. Yeah. So being locally modeled on CN. Okay. This is no longer true. The, so, there are counter examples due to Lambert. This is Neulander Nielemer theorem is not true in infinite dimension. Ah, so you mean that you don't have these holomorphic coordinates? Yes, you, uh, you, you can build the, examples the where the Ninois tensor vanishes, but yeah. you cannot define a holomorphic atlas. Okay. So formally I, precisely refers to okay. this. In dimension three, Brilinski, however, I think. Yes, I, I, I think Brilinski result is the only case where he is able to, to build a, a, a complex atlas. Yeah, formal Keller, I think in dimension three must imply Keller. Yeah, uh, the, that's why. Th that is but, very special. But uh, also, yeah, okay, again, you, yes, you only start with a manifold. Okay, okay, thanks, I understand. Thanks. And um, uh, actually, uh, I do not know if our formal, formally Keller structure is actually Keller. In the other dimensions, in seven dimensions, maybe with G2 structures and in eight dimensions with spin seven structures, maybe you could think about this. But in general, it's, it's only formally Keller. What you yes, in general, it will be only formally. Yeah, yeah. Although you have only four cases to examine in general this question, so maybe it's possible to think about this. If yeah. you can prove some extension, for example. Because I mean, maybe there's motivation from already dimension three that you get already. Yes, yeah, in, in that case, what one has, and in, indeed, original Brisk proof is completely, in a sense, independent of this construction, and it, it produced the, the complex atoms in, in that case. So that is a, a real infinite dimensional complex manifold. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So, <clears throat> So, okay, so let me sketch uh, how the proof works. So, so by the Lilleung construction, we have the almost complex structure J on the shape space. And, and we have our form, which is uh, closed by the comments above. So <clears throat> what we need to prove then is that the Ninois tensor vanishes or equivalently that the J is parallel. And here the technical lemma comes in. So technical lemma is a statement on the torsion of Nablopert. And one of its consequences is that J is parallel with respect to the Hyrex connection. So for proving this, we need the explicit expression of the connection and the ability of testing things on these very special uh, vector fields that we build on surfaces in the shape space. So in order to prove that nabla pair of J is zero, uh, Strictly speaking, we would only need a vector field along a line uh, to define parallel transport. But since J is an endomorphism, we choose also another tangent vector and extend also this other tangent vector to a vector field and in such a way that we have this two-dimensional family of vectors and carefully carefully chosen, choosing this two-dimensional family by the technical lemma, uh, we have this vanishing. So this is the main technical result of our paper, actually, that nabla perp of J 
yes, zero. And once you have obtained this, all the rest follows from classical results in differential geometry. Since uh, for any connection nabla, such that a complex vector J is nabla parallel, one has an expression of the scout and you know, extensor of J completely in terms of the torsion of nabla. And I'm reporting it here for completeness. So NJ can be completely expressed in terms of the torsion of J and uh, of nabla and of J by this formula. So this formula in particular says that if J is parallel with respect to some torsion free connection, all of the right hand side vanishes. And so uh, the Nino tensor of J is zero. But with when we have precisely proven that uh, the torsion free connection nabla pert mm -hmm. has this property. So this shows that J is formally integrable. And now to conclude, let me just remind how this condition on a almost scalar manifold is equivalent to J being parallel with respect to the levy severe connection. This is just another classical formula from Riemannian geometry. So if we are in a we are in a almost scalar situation, so d omega is zero, then we have this identity. We can express the inner product of the Nino tensor against J of X as an expression that involves the levi civita connection of J. So this means that it's perfectly equivalent to say that NJ is zero or that nabla LC of J is zero. And this concludes the proof. So this is all I was aiming to yeah. tell you in this talk. Oh, uh, thank you yeah, very much, uh, Domenico. Yeah, so let's have time to speak. Uh, I want to have a comment on the uh, uh, discussion between uh, um, Dominica and uh, Johan uh, on the KLA structure and formally integrated, uh, formally KLA. So from the beginning, I only uh, said that's a uh, basic of my memory that the uh, Brilinski only proved formally complex structure because uh, he also in our finite um, um, version of our paper, he puts uh, on um, yesterday on archive, so you can already see the, our final paper that accepted for uh, GSG. That we also say that the uh, Brilinski only compute Nijen tensor. He didn't prove, yeah, that is the KLA. That means he cannot find the by holomorphic coordinate. And then that's a not open question. I just checked uh, during the, um, uh, uh, check the book, open the book by Brilinski, then you look at the page uh, 180, uh, 128, and he says the theorem Lemper. The almost complex G that um, Brilinski consider is a never integrable. So that's a theorem 342. So that's a not open question, but that is a not integrable. Okay, for, mm. for the Brilinski case. And uh, that's uh, assumed to be also, we have not compute, but maybe that's a, uh, that Lemper, uh, Lemper theorem also Correct for higher dimension, but uh, he didn't not check, right, Domenico? Oh, I, I, I do not know if there has been any progress on that. Uh, I, I, I seem to remember that the complex structure he, he considers is not in integral. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, a, a real, it's just formal, but I, I, I may be wrong in saying this. Yeah, so such an only formal, not, uh, not uh, how to say. Uh, not only for man, not open question, like integrable or not, but of course that, that is a misproof by Lemper for Brilinski case. And then you can find that theorem uh, 342 on page 128 of this book, uh, Brilinski characteristic classic <laughs> and uh, loose by and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so uh, I, I'll 
spend one more minute to answer Igor's questions. So sorry for having been confused before. Uh, giving this web talk is always a, a big stress. So uh, in, in so where it was the definition. So here. So here it was. So uh, all, all the confusion came from the fact that I may have erro erroneously said that chi is an isometry. But no, no, that is not what what's happening. So chi goes to from the airfold cross product uh, airfold uh, external exterior pro product of V with itself to V, and mm -hmm. as property one, then the sort of isometry property is between uh, chi of the vectors and the airfold vector product of them. So, um, mm. but uh, if uh, let, let's suppose that uh, the 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 airfold wedge product yes. is very dimensional. Is sorry compared to let, let's just suppose that the R fold uh, wedge product yes. is very high dimensional with respect to V. It's high dimensional with respect to V, so. I mean, you know, uh, let's say V is, you know, 10 dimensional and wedge R V is, you know, a million dimensional. Okay. Just, just the, to, to, to uh, for the sake of argument, because then uh, Kai will have to have a very large kernel high dimensional kernel, whatever yes. it is. Uh, and then any vector that is in, any multi-vector that is in the, uh, in the kernel of chi uh, will, you know, it, 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 the norm of its image will have to be zero, even though the argument yes, is. Yes, that, that, that's true. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 maybe I've written something wrong in this definition after all. I, I, I have to check it indeed. So let's see. I have this. I mean, it's possible that the condition is slightly different. Oh, so let, let's see. So for instance, so, so for, for e, r equals one, there is no problem at all as for r equal uh, the dimension of v minus one. So these are the trivial cases. These are the, the cases where. Okay, so let, let's see what happens for v equal seven and r equal two. That is the. Yes. So in this case, so I'm saying that chi goes from uh, v with v to v. And if I take so a pair of vectors that go to zero. So two forms in seven-dimensional space are twenty-one dimensional. Yes, um, and of course I, I I I can pick so two vectors that chi sends to zero, and I can of course pick these two to be even. Or normal, I think. So mm -hmm. I, I would get some. I, I I would get zero equal one if I write it, yeah. it this way. So uh, the the for sure a uh, 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 mistake in the way I'm writing condition two. Okay. No. I, I I I have to fix that. Yeah, yeah it's understandable. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's a, yeah, you should put, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, 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 that fixes it. is a, a following thing. So I, I'm sorry that I uh, uh, even, uh, of course, I can open our paper, but uh, try to mm -hmm. figure out how to see it in the three dimensional case, yeah? Mm -hmm. it, yeah. Three vector product. In the three vector product, you see, that is, uh, you multiply, it's an extra vector here, then you have volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a generalized in action case. So you can remember that's the three uh, product on the three um, on the three vector space, right? Mm -hmm. So so I take three uh, product. 
then you um, uh, take the, um, uh, um, uh, how to say, um, uh, um, and it takes a waste product is a, you have two vector, uh, then you take which waste uh, vector product is a three vector, and uh, then you take the norm of it, it is a, a volume of this form, and the this volume of this form is a nothing else like a, the um, bilinear product of the, uh, so that is the same like the two uh, 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 vector product in R3, yes? You saw that uh, how you have to have the correct form, yeah? Mm -hmm. So if the three vector product is a, a parallel, is a, a, another vector, that's a, is you have the weight product, yeah? Mm -hmm. Then it's a equal zero, the volume is equal zero, that it generalizes in this case, you check right. Uh, so I don't want to uh, give you some formulas and you say, accept my formula. I try to see how to figure out yeah. the correct formula. The way well, to figure what, a condition that you can okay, give in, the product in R3. Then you see immediately what is a, a correct formula. Yeah, so a, a condition that I, I, I see immediately that works in R in R three is that uh, maybe okay, so the, the correct Riemannian norm of the of the R plus one form. Yes, yes, that exactly. That okay. exactly. Yeah, so that's uh, the way to figure out the correct formula. Look at a uh, better product on R3. So, so yes, so the, the, the correct one should be that the square norm of chi V1 V R, uh, this should probably be the this one uh now this does not make sense yet so the, so according to gray this formula this has to be equal to the but, but product of the how this volume no, equal to the let me write it that's yeah. a, a product of these uh of, um vector product it's the last extra vector yeah so that is the correct formula uh, so, to, hmm. uh, to, so to, uh, this is how Gray gives the definition. So, mm -hmm. so somehow I erroneously translated this determinant on the right yeah, with yeah. the square yeah. norm of that uh, wedge product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so uh, you um, so I am so, so how to say so of course it's a correct form easy but so you check and uh, like what the which uh, property of the um, um, vector product in R true to correct, then it translates the same thing for high dimension and case, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. By the way, I'm reading now in the Gray's paper that he says that this definition is due to Ekman, actually. Okay, so, at least it's not obvious that, uh, it is no longer obvious that in, in in these special dimensions, it, uh, it would not work. So it seems more plausible. Right? Oh, no, no, but, uh, he classifies them. So, so uh, yeah. So he, he, I, I just trusted Gray and sure. Emra okay. on this. Okay. Uh, I understand. Right. But, but yes, uh, of course, this way is at least not obvious that it, it, there are empty cases there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, so, sorry for the confusion at the beginning. I, I, I was just trying to, to give a, a a quick expre expression for the right hand side, but that was wrong. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks for the correction. Then. So, is there more uh, question to uh, the lecture by um, Domenico Fiorenza? So, if there are no more questions, let us thank the speaker again. Yeah, and uh, you finished our. Um, as, um, seminar today. <laughs>